This is a TI-99 4A, Texas Instruments 4A into the 80s computer market. Now I really didn't plan on ever buying a TI-99 4A, and I'll get to that a little later in this video, but I found myself needing one and found this one on eBay for a great price as a parts repair non-functioning computer. Now, I didn't need a working TI-99 4A, so I was perfectly happy with a parts repair unit. However, when I got it, I couldn't help myself, and I was curious to see what was wrong with it. So after taking it apart, and studying it, and studying it some more, I finally soldered some wires to the video connector on the back, because I did not get a video cable with it, and found that it did indeed work. So, here I am needing a broken TI-99 4A, ending up with a perfectly functional one. And it didn't help me either that on top of being fully functional, this computer's in perfect condition. This is the later beige model, which I believe is a little rarer, so I was also hesitant to try and sacrifice this one after finding out it worked and was in great shape. So I decided to go again for a broken TI-99. However, to get the biggest bang for my buck, since apparently I was now a TI-99 4A collector, I wanted to get one that was a lot with a bunch of goodies. Now this computer was also untested, and my goal was still to get a non-functional TI-99 4A. And of course, it worked. Well, sort of. If we leave it on for a moment, it does actually have some problems. And if this wasn't enough to make you question its condition, going to the next screen shows that it's missing characters as well. So great, now I have one that's much closer to being broken. But it's not quite, and I'm pretty sure I know what's wrong with it. There's probably a bad RAM chip in here, and when the information gets loaded into memory, it starts to become corrupted. I'm not quite sure what's going on with the video signal, that seems like possibly another problem, but it could just be bad caps like most things. But the important takeaway here was that I was beginning to realize I would never be comfortable parting out a vintage computer. So many of these have been thrown away that I don't want to take one that still exists and make it garbage. And so here I am with my extremely first world problem of being stuck with working vintage computers. Well, almost working. I will come back and fix this one later. And now we get to the reason I needed a TI-99 4A that didn't work. This is an HP 86B. This is the more standard desktop model from HP's Series 80's line of computers. It is perhaps the most proprietary vintage computer I have. It has a custom CPU. It has a custom BASIC that is quite different than all of the other ones that are derivatives of Microsoft's BASIC. It has a special CRT that underscans so they can get more information onto the screen. If you try and connect this to a standard composite monitor, then you will be missing information on the outside of the display. It uses custom ports for the printer and the disk drives. It has proprietary expansion modules that plug in to enhance the computer's usability including a really cool ROM drawer that would allow you to add new features to the kernel. However, despite all those proprietary components, the keyboard is made with off-the-shelf parts, which I thought was going to be a very good thing for me. Now, why was this important? Because over time, the keys fail and start to stick. This is obviously a problem if you're trying to use the computer. And as you probably started to guess, this is where the TI-99 comes into play. These are known as stack pole or high-tech switches. When you depress them, the plastic piece stops separating the metal contacts and the key switch is activated. So pressing it down moves a spacer. The TI-99 key switches work in the same way. There is a critical flaw in the design though. As you can see, right here, the plastic is separating at the corner of the square. The keys are held in place by friction fitting a smaller square into the larger square. But over time, as you depress the keys over and over again, and especially when you depress them a bit more vigorously than you should, 
this spreading problem starts to happen. This widens the plastic and when it gets depressed with the key stem in there, it can become stuck and pressed against the sides of the holder stem. Now the HP computers are significantly rarer than the TI-99s. If you told me that for every 100 TI-99s that were sold, they only sold one HP, I might believe that's a little light. So when most people have this problem with their HP computers, they have no problems sacrificing a TI-99 to repair it. But as I said, I'm not happy with sacrificing one vintage computer just to save another. And now we get to the crux of today's video. I want to design and 3D print new stems for the Stackpole keyboards. Was that a long intro or what? There was a lot of backstory I wanted to get through to this to explain why I think this is the best solution. But we're finally there and it's time to open this and start looking at those key stems. All right, I've only taken the top of this thing off once when I first got it, so hopefully I got this right. <clears throat> Looks like it. There aren't many things that I won't open, but for me this computer falls very firmly into the if it ain't broken, don't fix it category. Everything about this computer is very rare and very expensive. For the several hours of research I've done for this video, I could not find someone who has delved into the keyboard of one of these, or a TI-99. So I'm not quite sure what we're going to encounter. I knew that this had the waffle style grid, where all of the keys are held in place with solid pieces, although it looks like there's a separator right there. And I know that we have these plastic stems, but I'm not quite sure how this part is affixed to the PCB. So let's get the keyboard out and try and take a look at it. We have two ribbon cables here and here that wrap all the way around to the front of the keyboard. So I think those are going to be best taken out last when we have the most room to use them because they're very taut right now. I can see a screw here, 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 and here, and a nut right here. So I'm going to remove those and see how easily the whole keyboard comes out. You see right here in this area? I think my camera might be dying. All right. All the fasteners are off, let's lift this up. Having repaired a TRS-80 Model 4 keyboard, my biggest fear is that these are all soldered in place. Although now I'm looking at this, I can start to see some screws in here. So I think that is not going to be the case. But, lifting this out, all right. Bring it forward, what do we have? It looks like the metal contacts are soldered in place, but maybe not the blocks. <laughs> Ooh. Hopefully nothing uh, too catastrophic has happened here. Okay, so we're down to just the keyboard. And if we flip it over, we can see some screws. So let's start with this row right here and see what happens if we just remove these. I suspect the block is going to slide forward. And you know what? I'm going to remove all of these keys first. I suspect the block is just going to fall off. Right, maybe not so much fall as lift if it comes free. Hmm. Well, it seems like it's going to need to be desoldered. That's fun. All right, let's begin the fun of desoldering these. As usual, first I'm going to put down some fresh solder so these are easier to work with. All right, let's get removing it. All right, that's the last of them, and it did drop a little bit, so let's see if it'll come off cleanly now. Oh, perfect. If you look closely down inside the mounting point here, there appears to be two latches on either side built into the white plastic stem. So I'm going to try to undo those and see if it will release. All right, my favorite needle nose pliers here. We're up to the task and I'm just carefully 
rocking it back and forth, but it is slowly coming out. You can see how it's beyond the switch now. Uh, it's about to go. There we are. That is our failing piece. It's a very weird spring that it uses for that as well. It's, it's, huh. I don't know why you'd need separate compression areas that are the same tension, because the same they have the same spacing. Well, this might be a little denser, so that could be weaker. Hmm. Either way, this is one of my failing pieces, so if we look here, we can see how it is splitting. So, I need to model and print one of those. Yeah, definitely easier said than done. Well, after some trial and error and several design iterations, I have a model that I'm pretty happy with. So we have all aspects of the original key stem needed modeled, and I've included a separate lip on here that gives it more strength. So here's one I've installed in the key assembly compared to an original stem, and it works just fine. So here is a printed one that does not have the extra lip for strength at the top, but you can see that it does indeed work. I'm currently in the process of printing five more of these actually, but while that's going, I need to desolder the numpad assembly so I can get to this sticking one key. So, time to do that. Well, that was a pain, but it wasn't too bad. I'm still 3D printing more key parts, but I've unfortunately discovered that my 9 key in the alphanumeric area sticks sometimes as well. So I'm going to have to pull the entire primary area of the keyboard off. Since removing the primary key grid is the biggest hassle I could deal with on this keyboard, I think I'm just going to replace all the key stem parts at once and just get this over with so I never have to do it again. <sighs> well, the deed is done. I should probably go ahead and document the PCB for the uh, keyboard here pretty well because it's fully accessible right now. So I'll have some high resolution pictures of that available. I'm still waiting on the keycap stems to finish printing. I think they're about 17 hours into the print now. They're set at a fairly low layer height and higher quality settings and slow perimeters because I want to make sure that they work well with how many I'm printing. While this next large print is going to get another hundred switch stems, I thought I'd try putting in the five I printed while I was taking out the numpad to see how well they work. And I am extremely happy with how these are turning out. However, with the batch printing, I did notice two issues. So there is some stringing here that's happening because my filament is slightly moist from having been sitting out several months. And there was a slicing error that put a extra line right here on the parts and it's causing fitment issues so I'm having to manually file these to get them to fit in. Filament that isn't going to string because it's moist and a new slicing that you verify does not have that line would make these pieces fit perfectly the first time like the original one I printed on my stream did. I did not have to file or do any reshaping to that one at all. And here's what the cursor movement keys look like with the new stems installed. All the keys are working just fine and uh, yeah I'm thinking this is gonna work out really well and let's do an actuation test all functional